Hey, hey, hey. Hey, YouTubers. This is me, Mary. Once again. <laughs> Look like I got a, quite a bit to say. Well, not really, but on the days that I'm not in pain, I, I'll come on and say a little bit. But I was, I just got through talking to a, a dear friend of mine, and we grew up together, and uh, we're just talking about depression and how many people are going through that, and and it's an, an easy sickness, or whatever you want to call it, to deny. And I know I do have depression. And, then, you know, you go to the doctor and you fill out all these uh questions, you answer all these questions about your pain, do you feel like you're going to commit suicide and all that, and I don't have any suicidal tendencies, I don't, but when I think about my pain, if the pain doesn't get any better, you know, I can't picture myself living to be 85 or 90 in this kind of pain. You know, the chronic pain. So people, a lot of people don't understand chronic pain. And if you have a lot of issues and arthritis and just just a lot of stuff wrong with you. And only they can, they can, only thing they can do is try to control the pain. So that's what pain management does. And, you know, they want you to get out and do exercise and things. And I do have quite a few facilities for exercising. It's just a thing, uh, getting my ass up and going to these places. So I made a, a resolution to myself that I was going to be more active regardless of how much it hurts and how much pain I'm in because you're hurting anyway. So <laughs> what difference does it make? So that's what I'm going to do starting Monday, go to this uh community pool and might even learn how to swim who knows <laughs> but I was thinking about my mother and you know people in the um, past they didn't have facilities and they couldn't run to the doctor and say I'm not feeling myself they ran to the church and the bible and prayer and, and prayer did work I suppose it worked, I don't know, but because they would send off for prayer clause. My mother was a big fan of that, and, and they, we didn't have a lot of evangelists on TV. It was the radio. Radio was bombarded with this, and it's the same con game, that's what I call it. You, you give me money, and you'll be healed, so... My mother and a lot of women from the church that we went to, they all secretly, because if the good bishop heard about that, ooh, you would be scolded for doing that. But they all were in pain and they had husbands that mistreated them. And it was it was bad back in the day. And I watched my mother. She was a person, if she cried. She didn't boohoo. You didn't hear her. She didn't sob. But her face would be red and she'd come out of the room and have a, a tissue in her hand and she'd say, I said, Mama, what's the matter? She said, oh, my allergies are messing up and, you know, never thought about it, but she cried. She cried a lot. She, oh, man. So, I don't know. They cope with it. And and you get a lot of women, they use different techniques to cope with them because one of the members of the church, her husband was exactly like my father, or even worse. But when he wanted to beat her, she'd take her high heel shoe to him and she would beat him back. My mother didn't fight back. She didn't. So that, that had to be a horrible thing. And then it had to be horrible to watch your children Go to bed hungry and wake up hungry. Go to school hungry. Just go all day. I don't even know how we did it. 
But the good Lord, as they say, was on our side because we made it. We were some skinny, malnourished children. And I was thinking today, I don't remember hardly any food that we had uh, we could eat by ourselves. It's like a whole apple or a whole orange. You had to cut it and share. And you wasn't like you got to go back for seconds when, when you had the little meal you did have. You couldn't go back for seconds because there wasn't anything left. So even, I don't know, despair. That's what I call despair. But my mother knew how to make it in those situations because that's all they knew. They knew poverty. Her mother was in poverty. And her father, my grandfather was born in 1877. And they they lived through a whole lot. And Papa didn't he didn't say nothing, just leave him alone and let him have his snuff. And we ate a lot of iced potatoes. My my grandma Pearl would chop these potatoes up. And you ate that. You had a little old sauce and we sat on the floor. You ate that. And when supper time came again, you had some more fried potatoes. I was probably why I still eat so many. I, we call them iced potatoes. I don't know. It's short for Irish potatoes or whatever. But that's what we called it. And we made it. And it's just that when you get a certain age, I'm talking about the older people, if you don't have anybody to communicate with you about survival and make you remember how your parents survived. And that's why I, I, I keep my older friends that when we went through together and we talk about how hard it was. My brother and my sister, we talk about it and Lord, we made it. And it's a whole lot better than what it was. We do know that. So, you know, when you uh, almost at the top of the mountain and you're about to cross over to the other side, you really don't have that many worries. You know, you have your worries about bills and illnesses, but I don't worry about illnesses because I know that illness is the vehicle for me that will take me to the other side. You know, you, you have to leave here because of some reason, something kills you. And suicide may be a way for somebody, but I, I just don't condone that because why commit suicide when death is already inevitable for you? So enjoy every day. You don't have to commit suicide because that old, they call a grim reaper. He, he coming when he's supposed to, though. So stay here long as you can and turn lemons into lemonade. I mean, that's that's what I try to do. and It's just a, I don't know, a state of mind. And Sissy Spacek, am I saying a word? Yeah, Sissy. Yeah, she played in a movie, and it's the best movie it's called Night Mother. And this is, is the whole scene takes out in one day of her life. And nobody is in the only two people in the, the film is her and her mother. And in a 24 hour period, she commits suicide. And she tells you in the movie, her and her mother talk about it, what's going on in her life and the things she's been through. And you learn everything about her and her mental problems in that 24-hour segment. But in the end, she does commit suicide. I'm going to have to go get that movie. But it's Night Mother, N-I-G-T-E. It's short for Good Night Mother. But Sissy, I guess, basic? I don't even sound right, but that's... I forgot what else she played in, but I'm going to go to the movie trading post and see if they can order that for me. But, you know, things that help me when I'm not in a good mood, I find things that make me happy. And my son will come over and 
I'm watching the Three Stooges and just laughing and and he'll sit there and laugh a while. He said, Mommy, you, you still like that? I said, yeah, and it's stupid, but I like it. So find your favorite movie and some movies that make you feel good. I mean, that's that's my uh, my coping mechanism. So either a good book. I love good books, too. But we all got our roles that we have to hold. As long as we're here, and when we are here, we're out in the field. And you you got to do it. That's the way life is. But think about how your parents, how they made it and how they came through. I remember one time, oh, God, God, I'm so glad God saved me from that. I was only 18 years old. My oldest son was a baby. He had to be about four months old, I found out that my ex and a member of the church were in a full-fledged relationship. And her husband came and told me about it. And my ex admitted to it. And every time he left the house, I knew that's what he was getting ready to do. But I was so broken and hurt. I was in love with this man. I was infatuated him, with him at the age of 11. And I don't know how I, on my, in my mind, I said, I'm going to marry this man at 11 years old. No, not 11, 13. Yeah, 13 years old. I, I grew up with him and he dated every woman in the church because he was a drama. And man, they, even the old women loved him. But I said, if he ever kissed me, that's going to be it. He's going to marry me. And after my mother died, he started coming around, helping us out and taking me to work and whatever. And that night he kissed me. And that was my first kiss. And that was the bond that, that I thought was going to keep us together for the rest of my life, our lives. And he did love me. We experienced beautiful love. Oh, he'd sing songs to me, poetry, and just because uh, we got married in December, January, I had my first MS episode, and they didn't even, doctors didn't even know what it was. I couldn't walk. Only thing I could do was blink my eyes and swallow. My ex, my the newlywed husband, he would take me to the doctor every day. He would bathe me and feed me and nurse me back to health. But after I got well and I got pregnant, um, I think it was May. Yeah, that, that May. I had the exacerbation in January and May I got pregnant so I, I must have been feeling better but after I became pregnant all the symptoms went, went away and MS does that in women if they get pregnant the hormones they're producing will make the symptoms go away so I had a beautiful baby boy and my oldest son and I thought my life was just perfect we both had great jobs had bought a house at 18, we both had cars, and a lot of people envied what we were doing, and this particular woman did, and that devastated me so much. I'm 18. I lost my mother when I was 17, so I didn't even know how to grieve, but I, I cried every day after my mother died. I, I, I had to do a boo-hoo cry, but this particular night... I had made up my mind what I was going to do. I had a 22, and I was going to take the baby over to my father's house. My sister lived there. I was going to take him there. And I was getting ready to, I had his little bag packed, getting ready to take him. No, he was already gone. Yep, he was already gone. I had the gun, the bullet in the chamber, a little old 22. Yeah, I had already taken my son over there. Made up my mind I was going to do it. It was 9 o'clock at night. I said, they'll just find me dead and hopefully somebody will raise my child or his father will. But it was so much pain. I couldn't even take a deep breath. It hurt so bad. Do you know, I picked up the gun. 
when I picked up the gun, the telephone rang. And, oh man, this, this spirit, this God, the God and angels said, answer the phone. And you could tell who's ever on the phone goodbye because there's somebody want to talk to you. I said, hmm, that might be okay. But I picked the phone and it was my mother's sister who lived in Ohio. And I hadn't talked to her in almost a year. She would write letters. I mean, we still were in the writing letter stages and she talked to me and she said, Mary, how's everything going? And I told her, fine. And she kept talking. She said, you've been on my mind for a couple of days. And she said, and then she said, tonight, I knew I had to call you. I don't know why. And I made myself do it. And when she said, I made myself do it, I told her the whole story. I didn't tell her I had a gun in my hand, but I told her how this uh, Camelot wedding and this husband that I had and just the beautiful life I was in. I told her what was going on. And she began to pray over the phone, over my situation. And somehow or another, I was okay when I hung up the phone. And I took the bullets out of the gun and and just put them in the trash and took the trash out, put the trash at the curb, went and picked up my baby and asked God to help me do what I have to do to save the marriage or whatever. Because that was what, in the holiness church, that's what, in church all appeared, that was the stronghold of a family, the marriage. So I went on and, and kind of overlooked him and his ways. But that was my first real battle with that uh, depression. Because when my mother died, I knew I was depressed. All us kids were depressed. The the woman that <laughs> I told you about was beating her husband with the high heel. She was so depressed when my mother died. She, the, the my mother died at like six o'clock in the morning. And the undertaker, he didn't come pick up her body till like 10 o'clock uh, that morning. But this lady, she called us. We were all, you know, standing around my mother and you, you knew she was dead. My aunt put a mirror and well, no, a fog in the mirror. So we knew she was dead. But the telephone rang and I said, oh, six o'clock in the morning. Who is calling? And it was this lady. She called, she says, Sister Sims, that's what they call my mother. Sister Sims is gone. And my aunt said, how do you know? And she said, she's gone, isn't she? And my, my aunt started sobbing. And I picked up the phone. And I said, yes, yeah, Sister Lynn, she died just a few minutes ago. And she said, Sister Sims knocked on my window a few minutes ago. There was a knock at my window, and I woke up, and I looked out the window, and your mother was waving at me, and she says, I know she was, she was my best friend, and she's in a lot of peace because she was not happy with her life, and uh, that, that moment, it just seemed like her saying that gave me enough energy to prepare for the rest of my life. Just remembering that. She knocked on her window. And in my mind, I said, how come she didn't knock on my window? But that don't make sense to knock on the window in your own house and you just left it. So, I don't know. You know, I don't even understand all that about the spirit stuff. But she did knock on this lady's window and... Uh, Sister Lynn is still living now. She's 90-something years old. But uh, we just have to talk to a therapist now because they are available for us. They weren't available for us back in the day. Black people could barely buy groceries. Let's know go see the doctor. 
and there wasn't that many black um, psychiatrists. And believe it or not, I was born in the Jim Crow area. And you just didn't have white doctors. They didn't want to see us. You had to find the black neighborhood doctor and do the best you could. But anyway, I'm coming up on 20 minutes. But anyway, we ride through the storm. That's the thing. Ride on through it and and believe. And, and tomorrow brings a brand new day. But take your medicine. And if it's not working, uh, talk to your doctor. The doctor that prescribed me, tell them what's going on. Give me something else or whatever. And communication is key. But anyway, I'll I'll talk to you guys later. Not tonight, though. But y'all have a good night. Bye-bye.